as a local body of believers. Amen? All right. So, last week, I was not the preacher. And we had Pastor Summers back. And didn't he do a wonderful job, everybody? I was so pleased to have he and Judy back with us. They're back with us again today. Thank you guys so much. Um, It's a little bit hard following a sermon like that, to be honest with you. I've had to follow some difficult um, sermons to follow because they are literally that good. And so then you start questioning yourself. Well, how can I preach, you know, something that can be good or impactful? But the Lord reminds me, just preach the word. Just preach the word. And as we were working through the gospel of Mark, I found this little piece of scripture that I really like. I don't think I've ever preached the message that you're going to get today. So, I say we open up the word of God and see what he has for us. Amen? All right. It is from Mark 5, verses 21, and we're going to stop at verse 24. It's up there on the screen. Thank you, guys. So, it's about a father who asks for a healing for his daughter. The man's name is Jairus. He's an important person. But I want to preface this message by telling you that it's actually a long message with a message in the middle. Now, the message in the middle is going to be my next message. So, we're going to read the top part of the message. We're going to speak briefly about the particular healing that happens within the healing. And then I'm going to conclude by talking about Jairus' family. Don't be confused. It's actually very simple once we get into it. This is the New King James Version, starting with verse 21. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus was his name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and he begged him earnestly saying, my little daughter lies to the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed. And if you do, she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. And followed after him is what it means. Now, I want to share just a couple things here. We're not going to work all the way through the message right away. So there's more of the text that we're going to come back to. But as I've been working through this message and and, and passages uh, uh, in in, in kind of an exposition type type of way, uh, we will come back to the story. But let's first talk about The fact that Jesus is being asked by a ruler of the synagogue. Now remember a couple weeks ago, he was on the same side of the lake, close to the same side of the lake, where he was working with uh, a Gentile. But not today. Today he is approached by the leader of the synagogue. Not just a Jew, but a leader of Jewish people. A teacher, if you will. And we begin by understanding that a great multitude of people gathered there together. Jesus left the Gentile region around the Sea of Galilee where he met a man possessed by many demons. We called it a legion of demons. But now he returned to the Jewish towns that were near there and the large crowds immediately came to Jesus again. Again. Where were they before? Well, they weren't interested in going to the tombs of a demon-possessed man. But we're finding out from Scripture that they now want to be with Jesus because he is reaching Jews. Not only Jews, but one of the rulers of the synagogue. Now, the ruler of the synagogue was known as a modern-day pastor. Okay? He managed both the spiritual and the business affairs of the synagogue. This is who Jairus was. This man came in desperation to Jesus. How do you know that he came in desperation? The Bible says he fell at his feet and he begged him earnestly. 
because his daughter was at the point of death. No surgery, no medicine. Everything has already been tried, my friends. But she is at the point of death, and he is desperate. He's obviously heard about Jesus. He knows that he is merciful, and he falls at his feet, and the Bible says in the New King James Version that he begged him earnestly. Oh, that we would come before Jesus and beg him earnestly. Oh, that we would come before him and just hold on to his feet, my friends. Well, Pastor... You told me before I can pray in my car, and you told me before that I can pray uh, in in conversation while, while I'm at work in my mind, and you told me, yes, all that is true. But sometimes, my friends, there's a time for prayer that has a different posture. Am I right, Pat? We've been working through that this week, haven't we? Sometimes there's a time of prayer that needs me to fall to my knees in front of Jesus and beg Him earnestly. And I say this to remind you that prayer is not to be taken lightly as if you're talking to your neighbor across the fence. This man was praying to God, my friends. Because when you speak to God, you are praying to God. When you are begging God, you are praying to God. And he was not going to be denied by anyone. Let us not be denied. And in verse 23, he says, Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and then she will live. To you that sounds wonderful, and to me that shows incredible courage and faith. This man had great confidence in Jesus and that he believed that Jesus had the power to heal his daughter. But he also believed that Jesus should be there to make it happen. I'm glad you don't think that. I really am. I'm glad I don't think that. Because Jesus is not here incarnate. He's here in spirit. But here is the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, who says, I need you to come to my house, lay hands on my daughter, that she will live. Let me remind you, my friends, that Jesus has healed people remotely. Jesus continues to heal people remotely today. But we need to be in an attitude and posture of prayer. When a Roman centurion came to Jesus in a similar situation found in Luke chapter 7 verses 1 through 10, he was a Gentile. He had faith. He said, Lord, I'm a a man under authority and I have people under my authority and I don't deserve to have you come under my roof, but only say the word. Your servant will be healed. Just say the word, Jesus, and there will be a healing because I believe in your power. As if to say, I've been watching you. I've been aware of what you've been doing around the regions. Jesus didn't even go to the centurion's house to heal the servant. He simply pronounced him healed from a distance. But here Jesus did not demand that Jairus show the same faith. Jesus replied to the faith that Jairus had. Think about that for a moment. Jesus meets you where your faith is at. And he has compassion on you nevertheless. Some of your faith is strong, but there are times in your life in which it wavers, my friends. And I know this because it's true in my life. And when you're, when, you're, when you're weak in your faith and you're feeble and God meets you where you're at, just like he does Jairus. But Jesus will ask you to give the faith that you have, whether it be great or small. This is, was a weakness of faith. You see, the centurion was yet a Roman soldier, whereas Jairus was 
an educated Jew. So knowledge is therefore one thing, but faith is another. Some Christians confuse knowledge with faith. And so, therefore, we put educators up here, pastors, teachers up here on some sort of a a shiny pedestal. Let me remind you that if you have faith even as small as a mustard seed, you can tell this mountain to be thrown into the depths of the sea, and it'll do it, and that mountain is the problems and your difficulties in your life. Because the greatest scholars are not always the holiest of men. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Let us remember what God expects from us. So, four things displayed by Jairus that are necessary for answered prayer. Jairus isn't wrong. He's exercising the faith that he has which is so much more than most. So please don't misunderstand me. I'm just doing a little bit of a compare and contrast between the Roman centurion who is a Gentile and the man of God who operates the synagogue. But it doesn't make him bad. It doesn't make him wrong. It just means that he is not of the same faith as the Roman centurion. And I'm not where I want to be. And I'm not where I'd like to be. But God knows that I have faith in His Son, Jesus Christ alone. And so do you. So four things that I learned from Jairus. I want to share these with you. We must put ourselves in the presence of Jesus. Number one. you got to put yourself in the presence of Jesus. That means you have to turn the TV off. Turn the computer off. It means sometimes you go home from work a little bit early. You spend time in your prayer closet. If you don't have a special place to pray, make one. Anybody ever put an altar in their home? Never thought about it? It's not a bad idea to have a prayer closet. Okay? It's not a shrine. It's, it might seem weird to your neighbors. Let your neighbors think what they want. I have built an altar to my God in my home. And right now, the altar to my God happens to be my living room sofa. There is something sacred about getting in a posture of prayer in the middle of the night, usually after my son wakes me up. (laughs) Knuckles. Not realizing I'm asleep. And then I wake up and I feel the Lord calling me to pray. And I go to my quiet place my sanctuary. Sometimes he's walking around, but he's not too interested. Sometimes he kneels next to me, and I put my hand on his shoulder like I do my friends, and I pray over him. But it's my time with the Lord, my friends. So number one, we put ourselves in the presence of Jesus. When was the last time you put yourself in the presence of Jesus without anybody else around? Not worried about what the masses are thinking, what somebody in the church is thinking, Not worried about being seen. Number two. Another thing I learned from Jairus is we must humble ourselves sincerely before Jesus. Humility. I think is the barometer to spiritual maturity. We saw that last week. Humility is the barometer to spiritual maturity because knowledge puffs up but love builds up. Now, if you look at Jairus' life and how he came to know Christ, the Bible says that he fell at the feet of Jesus. He was on his knees in front of everyone. Does he not know who he is? He's a leader of men. He's a pastor. He's a scholar. He's the synagogue leader You don't just come before Jesus, who is a very controversial figure, and get on your knees before God and beg him in prayer. Oh, but Jairus does. And if he can do it, you can do it. And if he can do it, I can do it. 
We humble ourselves sincerely before Jesus. Number three, we must lay open our request with holy earnestness. How did he do this, Pastor? He begged him earnestly. Some of you have not because you ask not. You don't ask, the Bible says. And when you do, you ask with selfish motives. I'm not saying that Jairus' heart was in the right place completely, but he was more concerned about his daughter than he was about being an outcast in society. He was more concerned about his daughter than how he looked to his friends and what the people in the synagogue might think. There are people that come to this altar on Sunday morning and they don't care what anybody thinks about them. And there are people who do. And they have this kind of relationship with God. It's, mm. Come on, Steve. I, I'm this close to going to the altar this morning, but I just wonder what people are going to say. What they might think about me. No, he fell at his knees and he begged him earnestly. And he had a request with holy earnestness. Number four, we learn we must have total confidence in the power and the goodness of Jesus. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He says, come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. Some of you are, I think, afraid to tell Jesus what you want, what you need. Others of you uh, think that might be presumptuous. So you just say, oh Lord, if it be your will. Okay, let's pretend for a moment I'm Jairus, okay? Peter, I'm a powerful man. I'm the leader of a synagogue, Peter. I need a private moment with Jesus. I don't want anybody around. I'm not willing to be humiliated. Plus, a lot of people would be very disappointed by that. So, Peter, what I'm asking you to do is go talk to your teacher. Make sure he understands who I am first. See? And then once he understands who I am and the importance of my status, you know, my social status, certainly he would like to meet with me and tell him this is where I'd like to meet with him. Peter, tell him that I want him to be on time, but it's an urgent matter, and tell him, please, to show up because this is an important issue in my family's life. Now, go on. You're a fisherman. I'm a synagogue leader. You're a disciple, but I run a synagogue, my friends. I'm an important man. No, we don't see that here, my friends. We don't see that here because that's not the type of God we serve. It is level at the foot of the cross. Jairus has every right to come to Jesus and fall on his knees and bypass Peter, bypass James, bypass John, and get to the heart of the matter because that's what God de uh, declares of us. That's what he wants of us. He wants us to deal with our stuff. Some of you are grieving. Some of you are hurting. Some of you are lost this morning without Jesus. Some of you are backslidden right now. You've fallen back into destructive patterns in your life. But get into a posture of prayer and do what Jairus did before Jesus. And the Bible says in verse 36, Jesus says to him, do not be afraid, only believe. Well, it's interesting. I want to explain to you verse 35 and 36, if you may. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house. And he said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, do not be afraid, only believe. 
Now, what you don't understand is that during this interaction, there's a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. And while Jesus is preparing to go over to Jairus' house, because he has to lay hands on the daughter, who's also 12, there is an interruption. I've been in many ministry circumstances and, and sometimes services where there's an interruption. And it happens, right? So a lady who was bleeding for 12 years reached down to the hem of his garment and power had gone out of him. And he stopped to recognize the lady, so he stopped Jairus, who's excited to have Jesus come over and heal his daughter. And it starts this entire other healing in the midst of a story of healing. And it's for the next message, so I don't want to get into it too much, except to tell you that Jesus said to Jairus, after he healed the woman of her bleeding, Do not be afraid, just believe. Yeah, I'm feeling a little anxious right now, Lord. You know, I, I had you for a moment, we were on our way to the house. Um, this silly woman came up out of nowhere. She didn't have any money, she's unclean, she shouldn't have broken through the 12 disciples, but she did it anyway. And she broke some laws, and then she just took your time. And you know what, Jesus? When she took your time away from me, my daughter died. No, I know it doesn't say that, but I wonder if maybe Jairus was thinking that. Because I would have thought that too. I had him. For just a moment, I had him following me. We were almost to the house when there was an interruption, my friends. Jesus told Jairus to do two things. First, to stop being afraid. It sounds almost cruel for Jesus to say this to a man who just found out his daughter was dead. But Jesus knew that fear and faith don't go together. Jai Jairus had gone from anticipation and expectation and excitement to disbelief in a matter of moments. So Jesus says, do not be afraid, only believe. Faith and fear cannot exist together. Amen? Amen. Faith and fear do not exist together. There's a lot of things that don't exist together, so I made a list of them. Aluminum and microwaves. <laughs> How many people have tried that? As a kid, you put the smart pop in the microwave because you saw your mom do it on the stove. Remember the smart pop that kind of, you remember the one? Ronnie, I think that was your favorite thing, right, wasn't it? Ron, don't put it in the microwave. It, 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 it doesn't end well. Here's something else that don't mix. Because faith and fear do not mix. Gourmet and all you can eat does not mix. <laughs> Think about that when you're at the Big Red Apple, my friends, after church. Is that what it's called? I don't know. It's some huge buffet and I went there once. <laughs> once. Is it called the Big Red Apple? What's it called? All right, we have less all-you-can-eat meals, uh, places, than we used to. Black knee socks and plaid shorts. <laughs> I'm really sorry, guys. Let me help you a little bit. I'm not saying I'm snappy, in a, you know, but I do try. There's a few things I know about fashion, okay? Yes, it's true, I wear capris. You don't have to do that. <laughs> Nobody's telling you to wear knickers. But don't judge me for it. But sometimes the ones that do judge me for it are wearing black knee socks up to their knees with plaid shorts. <laughs> and flip-flops. <laughs> Some things don't mix, like faith and fear. Kanye West and Taylor Swift, they just don't mix. I don't know. 
They don't go together. I don't know why. Oil and water? Blue skies and stormy weather? Glass houses and stones? Superman and Lex Luthor? Peta and Michael Vick? <laughs> Too soon? Too soon? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not confirming this. I'm not approving this. It just doesn't go well together. You should have saw the things I took out of the list. <laughs> don't blame me. I almost took that out. Here's one for sweet Dina. Dina and Chili's. I love Chili's. It's my favorite restaurant. All right? How many people have been to Chili's with me? Raise your hand. A whole bunch of you. Okay. When Dina's not around and I got a buddy, I go to Chili's. I like Chili's. She doesn't find it romantic. I don't know why. I think it's perfectly fine. It's a very romantic restaurant. I love Chili's. Another thing is Pastor John and Hobby Lobby. They don't mix. I wait in the car. I don't want any part of it. I don't like the smell of it. I don't like the lights. I've determined I don't like the people there. I don't like the crafts. I don't even like the sign. There's something about Hobby Lobby. I'll wait in the car. I'm going to conclude with this. And this has been a topic of discussion in my house. And I think it's been a topic of discussion in yours. Ex-girlfriends and Facebook. Ooh. Dina says, who is this girl? She seems fairly attractive, I guess. So, Well, she's from Dryden. She's a girl that I went to school with. The next question is automatic. Who? I heard it. Did you date her? Am I right, Kelly? If you dated her, I'm going to delete her. And it happens. I didn't send the friend request. She sent it to me. This is a great witnessing opportunity. That's how it starts. No, it's not how it starts in my life, but I can just be friends. No, you cannot be friends. Because I want sweet Dina happy with me. Guys, listen. Faith and fear do not go together. They can't. They can't go together. And you have to take inventory of your own life, and you have to decide which one is going to push you through a situation. Because fear is debilitating. Fear is painful. Fear keeps you up at night. Fear ruins relationships. But faith brings unity and harmony in the body of Christ. Let's look at verse 37. We're going to close shortly. And he permitted no one to follow him into the house, now he's at the home, of Peter, James, and John, it's the only three he wants. He's in Jairus' home. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him, and he entered where the child was, where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand, and he said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated, little girl, I tell you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement, but he commanded them strictly that no one should know about it. And said that something should be given her to eat. So first of all, we learn that he took three people. Peter, James, and John. Often these three are considered the inner circle of Jesus. 
And there were those who wept and wailed loudly, lest you understand, in that particular day it was customary to hire professional mourners to add to the atmosphere of grief and pain at a funeral. Many of you know this. Some of you have heard this for the first time. Listen, but the professional mourners only grieved superficially. Notice how quickly they turned from weeping to ridicule Jesus. Ever since the poorest man was required by common custom, it was reported that they should hire a minimum of two flute players, one professional mourner in the event of a wife's death. It is probable that the one who held the rank of synagogue ruler, such as Jairus, would be expected to hire a large number of professional mourners. Now, I don't know if that's what you want at your, your, your celebration of life service. I would much rather have people tell jokes or stories or uh, there's to be some laughter at my service when I'm gone. But that's just me. You see, if there were people wailing and flutes are playing, there's, it, there, there's a sense of great love for the person. If you love me, tell a funny story. Don't wail. D.L. Moody on his deathbed said, soon you will see in the papers and it'll read, the wonderful evangelist D.L. Moody has died. But don't believe it for a second, I'll be more alive than ever. Don't wail for me. When Jesus put them all outside, he had nothing to do with these people who didn't believe his promises. He drove them out so that they would not discourage the faith of Jairus. And he says, little girl, I say to you, arise. Jesus spoke to a dead girl as if she was alive. Romans 4.17 says that God gives life to the dead and calls those things that do not exist as though they did. We need to pray for things that aren't as if they were, my friends. That's called exercising your faith. It's called believing that Jesus is going to do what he wants to do, but you are exercising the faith that he can do it if he wants to. And you get yourself in a, in a, in a right spirit of prayer, and you get yourself in a posture of prayer, and if you have to fall at his knees, you fall at his knees and you beg him, and you know that your faith is great enough to move the mountains that are in your life. Because he can do what he said he can do. Pray things that aren't as if they were my friends. That's faith. Now they were overcome with great amazement. Jesus didn't fail Jairus. And he didn't fail the woman who needed healing. This, 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 this woman who had been uh, bleeding for 12 years. But in ministering to both people, he needed to stretch the faith of Jairus extra far. So I started to do a little bit of reflection on this because I wanted to know, am I a little bit more like the woman who's been bleeding for 12 years or the father of the 12-year-old? And I think it wavers sometimes in my personal life. And so if it wavers sometimes in my personal life, perhaps it does in yours too. So let's look at in closing, let's look at a couple uh, just basic observations. Jairus had 12 years of sunshine that were about to be extinguished because his daughter was 12. The woman had 12 years of agony that seemed hopeless to heal. Just a simple observation. Jairus was an important man, the ruler of the synagogue. The woman was a nobody. We don't even know her name that was bleeding for 12 years. Jairus was probably wealthy because he was an important man. The woman was poor because she had spent all her money to get well. Jairus came publicly, but the woman came secretly. 
Jairus thought Jesus had to do a lot to heal his daughter, but the woman thought all she had to do was touch his garment. Jesus responded to the woman immediately. Jesus responded to Jairus after a delay. Jairus' daughter was healed secretly. The woman was healed publicly. But both were healed in this particular passage of Scripture. So let's do a little self-reflection of your own faith or lack of. Pastor, honestly, I used to be a person of great faith I hear often. But something has happened in my life and I feel like I no longer can really put my trust in Jesus. I mean, I want to, but I just don't seem to. I had a person, a dear friend of mine, come to me this week and say, you know, Pastor, I just feel like I'm going through a dry spell in my life spiritually. You know, I just don't feel close to the Lord right now. What should I do? We go through those seasons, don't we? And it's in those seasons that we have to mix things up a little bit. You know? It's in those seasons that we are called to fast. Or it's in those seasons that we're called to have a a, a greater amount of discipline in prayer. It's in those seasons that we are called to journal and get out of the box. Right, Barbara? It's in those seasons that we need to start um, really seeking counsel and finding a mentor for us. It's in those seasons that we got to take our relationship with God and, and shake it up a little bit to make sure that it's fresh and it's new and it's exciting again, my friends, because there will be plateaus in your life. Sometimes you even feel like you're falling back a little bit, but Jesus has not changed his mind about you. He loves you today as much as he loved you when he knit you in your mother's womb. He hasn't changed his mind. Have you changed yours? So I'm going to close by asking you to stand. And I'm going to remind you. Jesus said to the little girl, I say to you, arise. Jesus spoke to the little girl as if she was alive. I think Jesus speaks to us in his still small voice. But sometimes it's through a message or a song on the radio. But Jesus speaks to us through his word. There's so many different ways that he speaks to us. But are we listening? I know there's a lot of distractions in your life, especially this season. There may be physical ailments. There may be grief and loss issues in your life. But Jesus is calling. He's calling you by name. And my question is, do you have the faith to hear? Faith over fear. Where are you, my friends? We're going to sing a song together. If you'd lead us, please. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus.
That beautiful song was written by a song leader who was uh, becoming quite popular. And he was at a large church and he realized um, that a lot of people were coming to church to hear him, to hear him sing, to hear him lead worship. So the senior pastor pulled him aside and he said, I need you to take some time off. To the dismay of the worship leader, he understood that he needed to write a song about his feelings. It's all about you. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Maybe that's where you're at today. Thank you, Mandy, for singing that beautiful song for us. We need to remember that it's not about us. Your ministry is not about you. It's about Jesus. You're not serving Park Place. You're not serving for your own self-worth. You're serving Christ. It's not about you. It's about Christ. Every dollar you give to the local church, every service you provide, it's about Christ. You are exercising your faith in Christ. Faith over fear. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. We thank you for the faith of Jairus, but we also thank you for the faith of the woman that touched the hem of his garment. Jesus stopped, said, power has gone out from me. But Lord, people are pressing up against you. How can you say power has gone out from me? Jesus stopped and recognized a woman that had incredible faith. I want to be like the woman, Lord. We all do. But even if we're like Jairus, Lord, and ask you to come home with us, that you would touch our family members. Let us exercise the faith that you would have us to use. For even faith from God is a gift from God. But let us walk in the assurance that you can take the things that aren't and make them things that are. And we exercise our faith that way. Faith is the evidence of things unseen. Let us be reminded, Lord, that you are going to do what you said you'd do. That being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will finish it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Some of us are just hanging by the hem of your garment. Sometimes it's a thread. But we're not letting go, Lord. We lay our sins down. We lay down our ambitions. We stop striving. We stop worrying about money. We stop worrying about politics. We stop worrying about the things of this world that we can no longer control. And we worry about the things we can. And we exercise our faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You are dismissed, my friends. Have a wonderful day. I will see you soon.